Hello Guardians, it is Ebontis here, and this is going to be my series of videos with regards to the Legendary Campaign, uh, doing it as a solo player, and this first video is going to be an overview, because you may just want to get some pointers for it in a vague way without getting any spoilers on the missions without watching the entire thing. The future missions, I'm probably going to cut out the cinematics, but there's still probably going to be voiceover as I play through. Uh, and then I'm probably going to focus more on encounters and puzzles as opposed to running between things. So that's the future video plan. Probably not full 100% like uncut playthroughs. Uh, some missions may justify me like, you know, running between like one encounter to the next. And that's probably a pretty short one as opposed to some other ones where it's not quite the same. So this video is going to focus on tips, loadouts, uh, a couple mechanics that you might face and then just some general things that you want to pay attention to as you're going through the campaign. Because I know some of you are going to be working on this one, and if you still want to, and maybe you've gone through the campaign once and you hit 1500 soft cap, and then you still want to get that jump from 1500 to 1520 by doing all the missions on legendary, it's still going to benefit you to get 20 power level jump as opposed to doing powerfuls and pinnacles and going through the slow grind. This is still one of the fastest ways to level up. So let's start with the general idea of tips, and we're going to work through each piece of this. First thing to know about the missions themselves is you cannot overlevel them. So it's going to say recommended power of 1360, maybe it's 1370, maybe it's 1420. There's different ones as you go through. It's always going to have your power fixed. So I am 1528 on this character. I told you I went through the full campaign already. My effective power is capped at 1350. So it doesn't matter what my level is. All of my gear is effectively capped at 1350, so anything above that is useless. It's just, you know, 1350 is fine. Typically, you're going to be about 15 power levels below. These first two missions, you're just 10, so you don't even need to worry about infusing or anything like that. Later on, it goes like 1370. Then your recommended power is 1355. Then it's 1420. Your recommended power is 1405. Now, that could feel like a big jump, but as you go through each mission, each encounter is going to drop like multiple chests. If you're doing it on legendary, you get a chest at an encounter and then you get a second chest at encounter and it explodes with like blues and other things. They're also going to be giving you a decent amount of upgrade modules. But if you have the ability, I would recommend to buy upgrade modules before you go in so you can kind of do some infusion on the fly. But the biggest thing to know is you can't over level. And when we get to upgrading and things like that here in a second, Pay attention to what the mission recommendation is, because if you're like, oh, I'm a little tight on upgrade modules, but if you're basically there anyway, you're good. So pay attention to the effective power, and you may not feel like, you know, if it's 1420 and you're like, oh, I'm only 1405, you're good, because guess what? You're as high as you can be anyway. So pay attention to that number. That'll kind of help you with infusion where you feel like you don't have to do it as much, and they throw a good amount of gear at you by the time I was done. I literally hit like 1500 by the end of the legendary campaign. There's a lot of drops in this thing. And then there was a little bit of play on the throne world at that kind of big gap point. So I'm not going to show you the mission list, but it's like the fourth mission. It's recommended power 1420. That was the point where I went off and I did the first mission in season of the risen, which I do recommend. Um, and then did a little bit on the throne world for like patrols and a couple quests and some other stuff that I found. That was kind of that in-between. Then once I felt like I was close, jumped back into the story campaign and went from there. So that's my recommendation of timing is do the first three missions. And then before you do number four, that's when I would recommend to go explore Risen a little bit, which involves like the PsyOps Battlegrounds. Go explore the Throne World a little bit. Go check out that type of stuff. And then once you feel like you're at a good level, comfortable, maybe you do get to 1420. So then you're like you know, a little ahead of the game for infusion. Awesome jump back into the campaign and then you sh I didn't have to go back and like level anymore at that point that was kind of like the one stopping point at that point I had so many drops I was leveling up like crazy so that's the recommendation for power level just pay attention to the max effective power so you don't feel like you need to over level and pay attention to the mods this first week I think they're going to be on weekly rotation I had no radar basically the entire time and a couple missions in they also had like Improved radar, which is disabled because of this, but they also had painful melee, like melees were stronger coming in. So there were a couple moments where I just got exploded by a curse thrall or trapped and I died in some bad moments. But other than that, the, it didn't feel overly difficult. You've got galvanized, so they have a little more health. They're a little more difficult to stun. So if a knight's coming at you and you shoot him, he might just keep running at you when he normally wouldn't. And then mine was acolytes basically made pits of fire. Played most of this at range and that was the big thing. And we'll get to loadouts in a second, but most of this, except really one mission, you've got a lot of distance to work with on a lot of encounters. You can back up a lot if you need to. 
So when you work through this, just be patient. If you're trying to do this solo, that's the biggest advice is be patient, stay far away. There's one mission. I think it's like the third one where you got to be a little more mobile and kiting a boss. But other than that, it isn't actually too bad. Now let's talk about upgrading. Now, as I said, I played through the entire campaign on my Titan. So I have weapons that are substantially higher than you probably will on your first run through. 15, 20 for basically all my weapons. Remember that boosts up my average. So I was had 1350 armor, for example, like this. And my first drop ended up being about 1428 or 27 or something. It was a massive, massive jump for me. And that's why these drops are like, I have 1480 boots already, just because the average jumps so fast. Your second characters are gonna level up really, really quickly. So you will only have to do that little like, you know, mid campaign level section one time because your second characters, they will fly up in level. So remember that. So the big thing to note is when it comes to upgrading, you're going to start with these weapons that are like 1350. And as I said, the first couple missions, you need to be 1350 or 1355. So upgrading, really not a big thing, but it is going to throw some upgrade modules at you. So my recommendation is if you have a full slot of upgrade modules, like if you go into the campaign with 25, you can be a little li more liberal with the upgrading. But if you don't have as many and you want to use them sparingly, I would advise go buy as many of these as you can before you actually start the campaign. They're not cheap for some people I know, but buy at least some of them so you have some flexibility. But you're going to start with like 1350 weapons, 1350 armor. Then you're going to get your first drop. It might drop at like 1358. Eh, hold on to the weapon and just pretend this is 1358. And then you're going to get another one. Another one, This maybe this is like 1360. And another one's going to drop at like 1362. They go up pretty quickly. When you see like a 20 level boost in a slot, that's when you can start thinking about getting an upgrade. 20, 25, you're going to see some boost. Make sure you always hold on to whatever drop is the highest in that slot. So if this is the highest piece of gear in this slot for me, don't delete it. So your average goes up for future drops. But you don't always have to infuse. If you're comfortable with the weapon you're using, you like your current loadout, stick with it. That's totally fine. So then you're going to get to the point where you're upgrading. Well, do you do weapons or armor first? You're always going to want to upgrade weapons first. And the main reason for that is the amount of damage you put out is determined by your weapon number. So if I'm not hitting the required level, so if say the mission recommends 1405, it's that 1420 mission, and I'm only sitting at 14... Say I'm only sitting here at 1400, but I've got something I can infuse to boost it up. That is a major priority, is making sure your weapons are high enough. If your armor is close, that's okay. You might take a little bit more damage, you know, throw any damage resistance you can on. I'll cover something in the artifact. That's fine. But weapons are a priority to make sure those are at level. Now, if you have something that's like 50 levels behind, yeah, bring the boots up 50 points or something if you have a huge jump and then get back on the weapons. That's okay. But the priority is weapon infusion first to make sure you can always do enough damage to the enemies. You might die a little quicker, but if you can't hit them and do enough damage, that really doesn't help anybody. So weapons are a priority, then armor. But yeah, things like damage resistance, whatever chess piece you're wearing or you feel comfortable with, throw this on here. If you get far enough into the artifact and you can get this one right here, must acquire five artifact mods. So you gotta go like one, two, three, four, five. This would be like six, I think incoming solar and incoming arc damage is reduced to fact that one mod and two energy on your chest you can have incoming damage of two different types reduced i highly recommend just putting this on and forgetting about it unless it is just something that is like swimming in void that will serve you very well so don't forget about that one when you get there on the artifact now let's talk about loadout options and my recommendations for it all right loadout recommendations and subclasses is going to be a lot of preference I totally get that. I'm going to explain what I used and why, but the main reason of what I used. So generally, you're going to want some flexibility in your energy slot for shields. If you're not going with Arbalist, and I'll explain why. Arbalist takes care of every type of shield. Arc, Solar Void. You can break them all. It's also a barrier weapon, which is great. And you get disruption breaks. You get a little extra damage once you break the shield. If you have the Catalyst... I use this thing for the entire time. I literally just put it up here, never took it off. It's good for damage on bosses because it's got that linear fusion chunk damage. You also get crits out of it. If you've got the catalyst, you break the shield and then you get that round right back in the magazine. And it was just very beneficial. I used it a ton. 
I know not everybody has it, not everybody loves linear infusions, but I can tell you this is very good if you're willing to give it a shot. I had somebody while I was streaming yesterday for 12 hours say, I'm not entirely sure about Arbalest, there's probably better options. And then by the end of it, they were like, okay, I believe you. So if you have Arbalest, 100% recommend it. But I know not everybody does. You could be a brand new player. So my advice is find a sniper rifle for the top slot. And the main reason I say a sniper rifle is because you can get critical damage with a headshot and you have a lot of range, which you're going to have most of the time in this like entire campaign. Range is going to be a benefit in everything I basically tell you. So if you don't have Arbalest, run a sniper that you're comfortable with, that you think has the best perks on it, and pretty much forget about it. I'm not, I've am not. i toyed around with the grenade launcher when I ran through the first time. It was okay at times, but honestly, not really too worth it. Now, when I ran Arbalest, I paired it with a bow. I love bows, personally. Throw minor spec on there, and usually you're going to basically hit most red bars, and you're going to kill them with a crit. Almost all the time. As long as you're on level with the mission... I think most red bars, except knights, usually take a couple. But most red bars, like legionaries and thrall and scions, they all die in about one hit. So I like bows. If you got cabal, I typically would go void in here because that's kind of like the other type of shield that you'll see frequently for cabal. It's the incendiary guys. The flamethrowers, they have void shields, so you can blow up their tank. You can still hit any shield with this thing, but this is nice. If you're dealing with Hive, you'll probably see more Arc shields on Wizards and Knights, so Arc is a pretty good option there. Now, maybe you don't like bows. That's totally fine. But you have Arbalist. Well, you can go Scout Rifle. Same principle. I went through and was using Contingency Plan. It's an Arc Scout Rifle. Not bad. It's a little faster firing. Maybe I need a Void Scout Rifle. Got a Vouch Safe. You got a Royal Entry. That's, I think, the... No... I forget what the Void Scout Rifle is from Season of the Hunt. There's not a ton of them out there, though. But again, it depends on what options you have. But typically for the Cabal Encounters, you're going to want some type of chunk damage, a little Void here, and then Solar here. There's not a ton of Arc. There's probably a couple. So you might have to, like, plink them down with something that doesn't quite match or just switch into your inventory, get in cover, Get over to an arc shield if you have that to deal with, and then take it out and drop them. Then if you got to go back, you can. I wouldn't go in and out of your inventory option, but having the options with you is going to be beneficial. So, what do you do if you just want to not worry about switching all the time? Do you have hard light? Because you can hit arc, solar, and void with this thing and just switch it between reloads. It's got pretty solid range. You've got a lot of bullets in the chamber, so if things get close to you, you can actually hit them more frequently. And generally, it's a nice all-around use weapon. Breaks all shields. You just got to switch your ammo type. And you've got infinite ammo for all shields. So it's not bad. It's actually pretty good. We've got our sniper rifle and hard light. You could probably get through this entire campaign, I would imagine, fairly reasonably. If you're going sniper and rocket, make sure the same thing matches here. Rocket launcher, at least for that one. Or if you feel like the rocket launcher doesn't happen that often, maybe go sniper reserves. And then make sure you got ammo finders and scavengers on to match. But I went through personally, with bows, arbalist, and ascendancy. Again, ascendancy for a rocket launcher. You've got tracking when you want to, you know, just put a rocket onto a boss halfway across the room. Works really well. Chain reaction to clear a bunch of ads. Also works very really well. Ambitious assassin. This is one of those where if you get a kill, you can actually have two in the chamber. Works pretty well. Also nice to get some chunk damage on a boss if you get two. I would recommend a tracking rocket, though, for range, personally. And Ascendancy is just one of those that it's a pursuit weapon. Everybody had access to it for a while, so this is a highly recommended, like, highly recommended one. Grenade launchers trying to, like, arch stuff halfway across the room. Some of the enemies are floating in the air. I honestly don't recommend a grenade launcher. Something with a rocket, rocket solar is going to kind of give you a little variety because you got arc and void kind of rotating between here. If you need solar, yeah, you can pull out a scout rifle. It's completely up to you. But this was kind of my solar slot. There weren't a ton of solar shields. It was just honestly a couple few big Cabal guys. But it was just a way to get a big chunk of damage or have the Chain Reaction and Ambitious Assassin combo. It just really worked well. And it was legendary, so I had my option of exotics. So that's the reason I ran the loadouts I did. Arbalist, if you've got it, I clutched on this thing the whole time. Broke any shield I needed. Good amount of damage if I had it. Bows kept me at range. Good precision kills. Nice. Scouts if you prefer it. And then something like auto, an auto rifle, like hard light, is the only other option I would go with here. Just because still got a decent amount of range, but it has that multi-arc solar void use. 
this one down here worked pretty well. If you don't have Arbalist, a sniper, and then find whatever you're comfortable with with range, whether it be scouts or bows, but that sniper for chunk damage, again, important to stay at range. I wouldn't really mess around with too much else because you can stay ranged for most of it. Now let's talk about subclasses. Now, for subclasses, you've got options, and it's really up to you. Maybe you're a warlock and you're like, you know, I gotta have my Well of Radiance to stay alive. Do it. It's fine. Throw your healing with it on, solar grenades, whatever you feel comfortable with, that is totally fine. Uh, on hunters, titans, warlocks, whatever you do is where you're comfortable, but I would advise looking into Void 3.0. If you've been playing for a while and you had Void completely unlocked, some of the things in here are great, honestly. You can go to Ikora and you can buy all the grenades, so go to the tower at some point and buy your grenades, it just costs you Glimmer. Uh, the new melees, at least for the titan and the warlock, are pretty stout. Enjoyed those so far. And the aspects really get interesting. So, like, look into the aspects. Basically, Warlock, you're going to lean very heavily into Devour. And then just kind of ability and rifts and all that stuff. Titan is all about overshield. Your barricade creates an overshield. You can it, you got it for, like, 15 seconds. If you run out, run back to your barricade or recharge it. Hunters, you're going to be all about invisibility with Void. And lean into it. If you got Graviton Forfeit, you're going to be invisible forever. Get around, get a little bit of cover, do what you got to do, be invisible. So the when it comes to subclasses, I don't really want to specifically say what to do. I ran with Void for my Titan because I wanted to embrace Void for a little bit and see what I got out of it. But the, you know, the wall and barricade overshield helped. Devour here and a healing rift seems to help. Invisibility on a hunter. You guys, you hunters know how to go invisible better than I do. So definitely, you know, look into that if you got Graviton Forfeit, which is they're just sold, I think. Um, chunk that one on and be invisible all the time. You can dodge and go invisible. It's insane. So you've got options there. But if you would just prefer to go Stormcaller, Chaos Reach, and just blast things every so often, do it. Completely your call and what you prefer. If you want to go Celestial Nighthawk and you're like, I just want to be able to delete something every so often, or Golden Gun, or Dawnblade, maybe you just want to go Thunder Crash as a Titan because you want to be able to go Arc, and you want to just absolutely smash something in the face every so often. I get that. Nice thing about Thunder Crash, if you land on some of these very tough hive you got to kill, you're right there on top of them, and there's a mechanic that we'll talk about in a second. But when it comes to subclasses, if you can stay alive with a class, whether it has a chance to heal you, whether it has a chance to give you like a shield, um, whether you have a chance for evasion, whatever you can do to stay alive, whatever subclass, whatever exotics you prefer, that is what I would honestly recommend for anybody. Because staying alive, that's the most crucial thing. Melee kills restore health for a short time. Seriously, that is not a bad thing to take with you if you've got it. Again, look through your exotics, look through your loadouts, find your survival subclass and your exotics for armor, pair those things up and try to stay alive. You can do a lot of things at range every so often, things just go wrong, helps you when you can stay alive. So the final thing to cover is a couple of mechanics as you go through missions. Now, if you have seen, there's going to be a little bit of spoiler stuff. So if you want to see it fresh, this is up to you. One of the things that I'm going to explain here is there's going to be enemies that are shielded, but it's not going to be a normal shield. You can have an arc shielded knight as usual, but he's got an extra shield on top of that. Basically, they can have over shields now. Any enemy that is Hive can have an overshield, most of which you're going to face is Hive. The way you're going to know it's an overshield is when you kill the enemy, you're going to see this little blue moth start flying straight up above it. And you can't actually do anything to the moth for a little while while it's kind of going up. Then it's going to kind of like spread its wings. And at that point, you need to shoot that moth. It's going to work as a little mini explosion. Uh, this is why ranged attacks also work very well, hence the loadouts. But if you don't shoot the moth and you just kind of let it go and you forget about it, it's going to fly over to another enemy or right back on the one you were fighting and give them an overshield again. And then you've got to get them off of it. So the little moths are something you got to look for. If you see an overshielded enemy, hit it with whatever you're trying to hit it with, like whatever weapon you're going to. And then whether you kill it or whether you break the shield, take a second, follow the moth up. And then when it gets to where you can actually hit it, then shoot it and then make sure you are pretty much taken care of. So it happens a lot. It can be a lot of different enemies that those moths are on. If you see anything that has an overshield on it, or you see an enemy that normally doesn't look like as an arc shield, especially because most look arc-ish. But if it looks like it has a shield on it, maybe it normally doesn't. It's probably one of those that has a moth shield. 
So basically, you do enough damage to get the overshield off of there. The moth flies up. Shoot that moth. You get a little explosion, which is nice. That's not usually going to kill him, but it wounds him a little bit. And then work on that enemy. But those moths, they can be annoying. I get it. But they are a focus. When you take them off of an enemy, try and wait until you kill that moth to make sure it dies. So the next tip I want to give you guys is a bit of a spoiler. So if you want to see it live, tune out now. And I'll let you figure it out because it kind of explains it as you go. But in five, four, three, two, one, you're going to be facing Lucent Hive. And these are going to be the Lucent Brood. These are the Hive Guardians. These are the ones that can literally pop a super and do some major damage to you. Believe me, I, I got taken out by a Titan um, thrown shield. And I was like, oh, what is... And I just got nuked. So pay attention when they actually activate their super or they use their light. Run away from them, get in cover, do what you got to do to stay alive because they can be a bit tricky. Pretty much what you need to do is know that if you can't quite kill them and then get to their body very quickly, don't kill them yet or you're going to get to them again. You can take them down to very low health <clears throat> and then maybe clear out the ads around them. But when you kill them, you need to run up to their body and grab your go their ghost in your hand and finish it. And that's the big, that's the only way you stop them from respawning. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting them over and over and over. If you kill them from far away and they respawn, you kill them from far away and then they respawn again, that's on you. So that is why being able to get close to them when you kill them is important. That's why I said certain things like, you know, if you're a warlock and you're going to Nova Bomb it or Titan and you're going to Thunder Crash or you're going to go Celestial Nighthawk and just absolutely delete something, that's fine. Just make sure when you do delete one of those Hive Guardians that you can run up to it and smash that ghost in your hand by a finishing move, same button, because you do not want it to respawn. Happened a couple times to me because I wasn't quite paying attention or I wasn't close enough. So make sure you kind of whittle down whatever's around that Hive Guardian and then make sure when you get that Hive Guardian low that you're ready to run in there. And sometimes it's worth it. If you run in there, Hive Guardian is low and you like it might be a little scary, Pop a rift, pop a bubble, go invisible, whatever you got to do, go in there and finish that ghost. That is crucial to make sure you don't have to fight them again, because, you know, if they get their super back, they get to be that much more difficult. So that's just a priority. When you get that hive guardian low, make sure you're close enough to finish that ghost. And the final tip I'm going to tell you is going to be very vague, but it's with relation to puzzles. Now, there are two types of puzzles. One, there are things you have to shoot. Generally... If you're looking to find those things that you need to shoot, they're going to be around, but they could be up and down in different directions. So just look around and look all around. The other puzzle tip I'm going to give you is one of these things doesn't belong here. One of these things just doesn't belong. That will help you when you hopefully find it. Try not to give you too much because I'll run through the full missions later on. But that basically wraps up everything for this video. You can't be over-leveled for the missions. You're going to play basically every one of them at contest. So once you get to a certain point, don't worry about over-upgrading or wasting upgrade modules. Just make sure your weapons are the priority as you do. For loadouts, you're going to want range. You're going to want options for shields. Cabal, you're going to have, you know, a decent mix in there. You mostly have Hive in this thing that you're going to be facing a lot of the time. There's one other Cabal that you go through, but yeah, it's only a couple times for Cabal. And then for your loadouts, as I said, range is important. Whatever you're comfortable with, whatever subclass you want to use, that's fine. And hopefully you guys got something out of this. If you enjoyed the video, drop a like below. Leave a comment if you've got questions. And then with regards to actual each mission playthrough, those are going to be coming up basically today and tomorrow and as quick as I can get them done, along with exotic quests mixed in. So thank you guys very much. If you did enjoy this one um, and you want to hear more from me, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me streaming over on twitch.tv slash Ubontis right here on YouTube. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, which I know most of you haven't, hit that subscribe button, hit that alert bell, and thank you guys for all the support, all the Patreons, all the channel members. You guys are amazing. Thank you for that extra level of support. I'll see you soon.